A.B. and Larissa Rhine are two intellectual heroes to me. Um, I'm in the position of being a person who's never had the opportunity uh, to meet uh, his heroes. You know, many of the people who I view as um, sources of, of inspiration, sources of insight, people who help me find my own voice as a writer and speaker uh, passed before I, I came uh, into the subject matter that's come to define my life, which is the study of metaphys metaphysical ideas in history and practice. And <clears throat> JB, as some of you know, um, has been a particular source of inspiration to me, and I never miss an opportunity uh, when speaking about parapsychology in classes, uh, in the media, in books, to point out the solidity uh, and the gravity of J.B. Ryan as a man, as a researcher, and how tirelessly he labored to amass statistical evidence for the anomalous transfer of information in laboratory settings, or ESP. And one of the things that has always moved me about J.B.'s career and Luisa's career is not just the depth of their research and their absolute dedication to gathering impeccable data and taking every safeguard that a clinician can against the pollution or corruption of that data uh, in any way, but it was the manner in which they, they spoke about this data. You know, I hardly need to say this to most people who are on this um, presentation with us tonight, but perhaps certain things do bear repeating. Uh, perhaps we lose sight sometimes of the big picture, you know, in, in terms of what it is that, that we're working toward as people who have a dedicated interest in uh, questions of parapsychology. You know, I, I often say to people that if the entire parapsychological field had just stopped in um, the mid-1930s, and there are some of our interlocutors in the professional skeptics community who would be very happy to imagine such a scenario. So I invite them to imagine that scenario along with us tonight. What if the field of parapsychology, the clinical study for non-local intelligence, for extra physical abilities of the psyche, for the presence of extra physicality in our world, call it by whatever terms you wish, what if that had just for some reason or another stopped in the mid-1930s? It's interesting to realize that the card experiments, the Zener card experiments that J.B. and Louisa Ryan uh, performed at the parapsychology lab at Duke in those early years, those experiments in and of themselves would be enough to give us evidence of extra physicality, of extra locality. If we just look at the statistical data that they so painstakingly gathered where certain subjects would continually, over tens of thousands of trials, evince evidence of higher than chance rates on a five suit deck of cards, and that this material was gone over and over, was juried, was reviewed, was penetrated by every kind of transparency, everything was included, Null sets, something that I always rush to point out to people is that J.B. Ryan was actually one of the pioneers in the social sciences in exposing null sets and all data um, in the documentation of his experiments. Very important thing to point out by itself. The very fact that over tens of thousands of trials JB was able to demonstrate that certain individuals continually and repeatedly in a replicated, documented, transparent manner safeguarded against any kind of clinical pollution or compromise evinced the ability to glean information 
in ways that surpassed ordinary sensory experience. That statistical data in and of itself opens the door to the infinite. Do I exaggerate? Am I being hyperbolic? Consider, you know, once the individual or certain individuals can be demonstrated to exchange information in ways that exceed ordinary sensory experience, once you've gathered unimpeachable statistical data, as JB did, that demonstrates anomalous transfer of information, you've effectively demonstrated non-local intelligence or the extra physicality of intelligence. And in cracking open that door, in cracking open that door, you've opened the door to infinitude. You've opened the door to an expanded view of the human situation that goes beyond cognition or uh, motor skill, flesh and bone. You've begged the question of the existence of a non-local field of intelligence, call it what you will. Some people use the term unified field. Infinite mind, the ancient Greeks used the term nous, which meant like a kind of overmind or infinite mind. The scientist and mystic Emanuel Swedenborg spoke of a divine influx. Some speak of infinite intelligence, the creative field. Call it what you will, call it what you will. You've demonstrated human participation in some field of intellect that goes beyond the physical. And this begs all kinds of questions of the survival of human personality after death, of the question of the infinitude or the immortality of some aspect of the psyche. We have terms for this. You know, we, people speak in terms of spirit or soul or what have you, but these are just words that we're using to try to find some consensus around ineffable experience. Perhaps, you know, JB's findings, if we were to stop even there in the mid thirties, put us in front of more questions than they do answers. But the questions are the questions that have animated the deepest human wish to know since time immemorial, literally since time immemorial. I remember years ago discovering that there were remnants in the Negev desert of an altar uh, that was more than 25,000 years old. That was more than 25,000 years old. That primordial human beings, our primordial ancestors, uh, had built in order to uh, worship the moon, to pay homage to the moon. And, you know, upon learning this, I, I, I fell to my knees, you know, with, 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 a, uh, with a sense of emotion and with a sense of, of, of tears, you know, in my eyes and felt choked up because I thought, wow, you know, this is one of the oldest relics that we possess of our ancient common ancestry. And what were these profoundly ancient men and women doing? They were looking for a larger sense of self. Of course, you know, there were different things that needed to be done in order to make life manageable. You know, reproduction, hunting, agriculture, shelter, warmth, all necessary or we wouldn't be here. But in addition to those activities, they were seeking a higher sense of self. And well, I can't even fathom the years, you know, 25,000 years. You know, it's hard to fathom. It's hard to fathom. I mean, this was primordial human life. Seeking a higher sense of self. A connection to the cosmos a connection to an infinite greater surrounding world that wasn't physically touchable, that wasn't a palpable tactile experience, but that they felt as real, sufficient, so that they took time out from the necessities of daily survival 
and they included within that retinue of core activities that sustained life um, the worship of something greater, a greater force. I can barely use the words, but if you move forward 25,000 years, uh, 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 a span of time I can't even quite imagine, but if you move forward 25,000 years, if I can even speak in those terms, you know, here you have these experiments that demonstrate that primordial men and women were right, were right. They do have a connection to something greater. We do have a connection to something greater. And these experiments that JB did, if you were to stop the clock right then and there, tell us that, provide evidence for that, comport with the testimony of seekers from time immemorial. And I don't use that as a figure of speech. I use that quite literally. And that's one of the things that he and Louisa did. One of the things that he and Louisa did. There's been so much more since then, obviously. The field has gone in so many different directions with precognition experiments and experiments in retrocausality and the Gonsfeld experiments and a whole wide range of experimentation for which brilliant figures, brilliant figures, including Jessica Utz, Dean Radin, Daryl Bem, men and women associated with the Rhine, a whole range of figures struggling in an atmosphere where funding is very difficult to come by, even though, as we all know, uh, the funding is very economical. Parapsychology is probably, arguably, arguably the most economical field within the social sciences. And yet the funding, obviously, because of polemical debates, is, is very difficult to come by. And yet struggling against those odds, and those of you who have written grant proposals are well aware that writing grant proposals is a, a career in and of itself. But you've done it, you've done it, and you've gotten the funding, and you've kept this search alive, you've kept this scientific search alive. And so much else has gone on in the generations that have passed since those early days. And yet if that's all we had, if that's all we had, that material uh, would still justly be called visionary, visionary. And it's extraordinary. You know, and when I speak about parapsychology in the media, I guess maybe this is a, um, a tribute uh, to JB. I speak about it in terms that could be considered somewhat conservative because JB was always conservative in the um, implications that he drew from his own data. If he were here tonight, I don't know if he'd be comfortable with me talking about doorways to the infinite and so forth. You know, JB was very reserved very conservative in talking about the implications of his data, and that, that has been an influence on me. And uh, I was on a very popular podcast several weeks ago, and the host said to me, you know, um, what you're talking about, you know, uh, we, could, we could take it in such wild directions. You know, it, 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 it's so provocative. And I said, you know, I dig that, of course, of course, but I'm, I'm trying to be purposefully conservative about the material. And he said, I, I hear that. I, I hear that in your descriptions and I appreciate that. And I said, you know, the reason I'm trying to be purposefully conservative is because just the, the basic facts themselves are extraordinary. We as a human community have never come to terms yet with even the basic facts themselves of what JB accomplished. And I believe, and I'm not somebody who's uh, waxes optimistic about changes in paradigms or epics or turnovers in human awareness or anything of that nature. Um, but I do feel uh, that maybe, maybe within the time that, that we're living right now, uh, the public is going to be in a position to revisit some of this material because we are in a, in a state right now as a human community where on one hand, there's terrible divisions. I don't need to tell you about all the cultural, and political, and national divisions. It's, it's gravely, gravely serious. Without detracting from any of that at all, we are, as a human community, I believe, also, right now, in the here and now, experiencing 
in a real way, a renewed appreciation for the numinous. And I say that with care. Part of the reason I say that is because I feel that we are living through a moment right now that's unique. Because, among other things, the, 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 the question of the, um, the UFO thesis since about 2019 has gone mainstream. The UFO thesis is mainstream. With the release of um, Navy cockpit videos, with the release of, or first the leak, first the leak, and then later the, 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 the validation um, of uh, uh, high-definition videos that uh, the Pentagon and Department of Defense uh, has had uh, on file with the realization, with the uh, admission following leaks that, um, contrary to uh, what the public has understood, the um, military has continued uh, its study of UFOs uh, for the past couple of decades, and um, the recent nine-page report that the Department of Defense released uh, citing uh, close to 150 uh, examples of uh, UFO-related activity uh, for which the DOD said it had no uh, explanation and, um, and that these sightings uh, uh, evinced uh, a advanced technology that was not presently known to exist on this planet right now, not among Chinese government, not among the Russian government, and uh, there was the admission of an unknown. And different presidents, including Barack Obama, are on record as saying, yes, there are aerial objects that we have impeccable records of and no explanation for at this time. So, you know, dig that. Whatever other backstory is going on, you know, we are experiencing at this instant in our generation the mainstreaming of the UFO thesis. You know, when I was a kid, if you talked about UFOs, yeah, some people were interested, but most people, a lot of people, would say, oh, you know, swamp gas, weather balloons, delusion, little green men, nonsense. No serious person says that anymore. No serious person says that. I remember in 2019, I attended a panel at the Guggenheim Museum here in New York City, where I'm speaking from on the subject of UFOs. And this was unusual because the Guggenheim is not known as a fount of occult passions. And it was, it was, it was a moment, it was a moment. And the curator came up to me and he said, let me ask you a question. At what point do you think it's gonna be intellectually embarrassing in our culture for someone to just out of hand dismiss the UFO thesis? And I said, you know, honestly, literally, right now, right now, no serious person anywhere, whether in the military, the arts, any walk of life, a teacher, science teacher, biologist, chemist, everyday person, no serious person would issue just a blanket dismissal of the UFO question. Now, this is not directly related to parapsychology necessarily, but it opens us to questions of, of the numinous, of the greater, of of dramatic and unimpeachable exceptions to the the straight story, you know, that we grew up with, where we understand, you know, time is linear and events are singular, and if you can't see it, feel it, smell it, touch it, or taste it, it doesn't exist. I mean, most of us, most of us probably grew up in that kind of atmosphere. I certainly did. Yes, you know, there was space made for religious worship, but you know depending on your background, well, you know, that's on a Sunday or that's on a Saturday or whatever. You know, that's not something that goes on on, you know, Tuesday at two o'clock in the afternoon. And now we're realizing Tuesday at two o'clock in the afternoon is a lot stranger than we were brought up to, to understand. The UFO thesis brings us to questions of interdimensionality because one of the arguments that was forwarded by my friend Jacques Vallée, and that I think has, again, you know, is more and more entering the mainstream. Jacques, as some of you know, is a distinguished uh, UFO researcher and um, a venture capitalist. He was uh, one of the researchers who helped develop the earliest version of the internet. And 
uh, you know, Jacques made the point going back to the late 1960s that if you use the reasoning of Occam's razor, which says the simplest uh, answer that covers the greatest number of bases is likely to be right, um, he's made the case, I think very persuasively, that the working thesis of interdimensionality is easier, is easier applied to the UFO question than is the challenge of craft spanning the vast, vast distances of space. Interstellar travel is tougher to theorize than interdimensionality. Today we have theories of interdimensionality that are enormously involving and in some cases very persuasive. Some of these theories go under the rubric of what we call string theory. One of the variants of string theory is that metaphorically speaking, um, although we're not really sure if it's strictly a metaphor, I should be clear about that, all of reality exists along these, this, this network of strings. Every particle, every universe, everything that is a thing, regardless of its vastness, exists along this network of strings. And we, the human species, dwells within a certain dimension, a certain universe, along one of these strings. And there are activities going on all the time, always and everywhere. Microparticle activities, subatomic activities, macro activities, activities that involve mass events, like a black hole or a supernova, in different dimensions or universes along these strings. And everything affects everything else, which would provide us with certain explanations for why, for example, infinitesimally small or large objects mirror one another at a distance, or why, for example, our classical models of quantum mechanics, now going back 90 years or so, not only suggest but necessitate the existence of simultaneous events, the existence of an infinitude of events, events that exist within superposition, that only get localized, that only come into the awareness of the individual observer when someone makes a decision to take a measurement. Make a decision to take a measurement, and that which existed in a so-called wave state becomes localized to a particle state and exists in one place, whereas interference patterns have told us that that particle previously existed in an infinitude of spaces. And if that particle existed in an infinitude of spaces, that too means that there is an infinitude of outcomes, not in potential, but actually, but actually. Because you have different events going on simultaneously. The great physicist Erwin Schrodinger conducted a thought experiment called Schrodinger's Cat, where he demonstrated that if you were to take a house cat, and again, this is a thought experiment, and I'm speaking of a version of it. If you were to take a house cat and put a collar around its neck that had a poisonous device on it, and that device got tripped when exposed to a single particle, single atom or subatomic particle, and you put that cat into one of two boxes and then he directed an atom, a single atom at the box, and then you went to check on which box the atom went into, would the cat be alive or dead? Well, of course, all common sense tells us, well, that depends, right? If the atom went into the empty box, the cat would be alive. If the atom went into the box with the cat and the cat was wearing this collar with the poisonous device that got tripped by exposure to a single atom, the cat would be dead. And Schrodinger said, no, no. In point of fact, both outcomes are real and both outcomes are actual and simultaneous because at one time we can demonstrate that when that atom was in a wave state it was in both boxes and it became localized only when an observer made the decision to check so you would have to have a dead alive cat not one or the other but a simultaneously dead alive cat and for that matter if you waited some period of time let's say eight hours before checking the boxes, not only would you have a dead alive cat, but 
you would have a cat, a living cat that was now hungry because it had been left in the box for eight hours. You actually created a history. You created a future. You created a present. And that's one of infinite simultaneous events. How can this be? It's surreal and yet necessary if our quantum physics models are real. I often say to people that if our jury clinical ESP data is not real, then our statistical model is flawed in some way that we do not yet understand. Because this material has been replicated over and over and over again. I may get to some of that later. It exists. It's been meta-analyzed. It's been juried, it's been written about, it's been repeated. So if, if there's something wrong with our statistical models for testing for anomalous transfer of information, then there's something wrong at the foundational base of how we conduct clinical research. But if we're going to accept that there's nothing wrong with how, at this point in time, we conduct clinical research, we have to accept the evidence for anomalous transfer of information. Likewise, Schrodinger was creating his thought experiment to compel his colleagues to accept the outrageous implications of their own data. String theory is a model that at least helps us to unify events in this quite clearly surreal reality in which we live. So, bringing things back to the UFO thesis, is it possible, is it possible that when we experience UFO phenomena, we are getting glimpses of or intersecting with or encountering events or material or beings that exist in other dimensions along this string? Is it possible that a great deal of enduring anomalous testimony could be attributable to the same thing? We give these things names. We call them Bigfoot, or we call them Loch Ness Monster, or we call them Poltergeist, or we call them Crisis Apparitions, or we call them Ghosts, or we call them Dead Alive Cats. But it could be that we live in this world, I'm using world in a very broad sense, we live in a reality that exists along these strings and is not only affected by things that are going on in other dimensions, either on a particle or a macro level, but, but in fact, sometimes we crisscross with events in these worlds and we struggle to find ways of, of talking about these things or we struggle to find ways of statistically documenting these things. But isn't it extraordinary you know, that, that we can really be having this discussion in a concrete way in the 21st century. And it's impossible to say these questions, you know, they can be waved away as uh, illusory. There's, there's been a change, you know. We really can't wave away these things as, as illusory any longer. And, you know, it's possible that maybe we get glimpses of these interdimensional uh, events when we're using very fine instrumentation. Um, so in the particle lab, when a scientist is measuring something, or for that matter, in the parapsychological lab, depending on what kinds of experiments are going on, he or she is using exquisitely uh, fine systems of measurement. He or she is gathering data using very, very finely tuned uh, systems of measurement. Well, you know, what, what, what are our senses other than organic systems of measurement? We detect climate, distance, smell, height, perspective, and we're measuring the world as we experience it, at least. 
So perhaps there are certain individuals who at certain moments are capable of an exquisitely fine measurement and they have an experience. And as it turns out in certain cases, perhaps those experiences can not only be statistically demarcated, but maybe, maybe can also be physically recorded by the means that, that we possess right now. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making some leaps here, but we as a generation have to make leaps to at least theorize, well, you know, what is a delivery system for ESP, for example? You know, what is an explanation for um, this advanced technology? Maybe it's earthbound technology that we don't know about. That's possible. But shame on us, you know, if we exclude other questions based on important testimony and data gathering. So maybe it is more efficient for us to think in terms of interdimensionality than to really grapple with the questions of how a physical craft could travel over the unthinkably vast distances of space. You know, these are all questions that we face today. We face broadened questions about the nature of the mind. You know, we're seeing studies in placebo research that's like nothing the field has seen since it uh, was was born as a identifiable field of study immediately following the Second World War. We have seen the efficacy of placebo surgeries. It's hard to believe. We have seen placebo studies in which large numbers of people have reported lasting relief being administered a transparent placebo. There was a famous experiment using transparent placebos at Harvard Medical School in 2010, where a group of sufferers of irritable bowel syndrome were separated into two different groups. One was a control group and they were given no treatment whatsoever. And the other, the study group, uh, was given uh, a so-called <clears throat> transparent placebo. They were told that they were being given an inert substance. You know, usually placebo studies, of course, are based on a decoy substance, a sugar pill or what have you. They were told they were being given an inert substance. And 59% of the people in the active group reported sustained and lasting belief versus 35% of the people in the control group. And in, in, in such studies, that's considered very statistically significant. So just the suggestion if I can extrapolate, just the suggestion of the efficacy of the mind-body connection was sufficient in and of itself to generate the placebo response. It's quite remarkable, and it ties into something that JB had uh, uh, determined from his own research. I, I s referenced earlier how incredibly conservative JB was in drawing um, implications from, from his research. And... Uh, in the afterward to a British edition of his monograph, uh, Extrasensory Perception, originally published in 1934, JB made the observation that um, one of the critical factors that determined whether there would be any results at all um, with a subject was uh, a presence of conviviality in the lab, uh, uh, the subject being dedicated to the uh, the card experiments, uh, an absence of fatigue, um, enthusiasm, prevalence of uh, uh, comity in the lab among the researchers and the subject. So uh, in short, in short, um, hopeful expectancy, hopeful expectancy to speak uh, cumulatively, seemed to be the, 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 the critical factor uh, in determining whether results would appear. So if a subject was bored, fatigued, uninterested, results would spike. If they took a break, had a cup of coffee, had a conversation, went outside, whatever, uh, results would, would go up again. So ho a hopeful expectancy, enthusiasm, conviviality seemed to correlate to results. And I thought, wow, you know, 
only J.B. Rhine would, would make that as an afterthought, you know. This is monumental because the field of modern placebo studies hadn't even gotten started yet in earnest. And here he was, you know, putting his finger on what seems to be the trigger for what we call the placebo response, which is hopeful expectancy. So the question is, you know, how can we engender hopeful expectancy uh, without deception or decoy? Uh, how can we generate hopeful expectancy uh, giving the patient uh, accurate information? You know, some physicians have a problem with placebo studies because they feel, well, you know, it's a benevolent deception. You're still deceiving somebody. And there's truth to that, you know. So the question for our generation becomes, okay, so, you know, obviously the patient is owed accurate information. So how do we foster this atmosphere of hopeful expectancy that seems to trigger uh, results in the ESP lab, results in the placebo lab, uh, without resorting to a, a decoy substance? You know, these are very, very big questions that we face today. And uh, there's a, a psychologist, Ellen Langer at Harvard, who has also done uh, experiments in the mind-body connection using transparency. Um, several years ago, she did a study with uh, hotel mates. And um, Langer and her collaborators found that um, uh, uh, many hotel maids um, are... Uh, obese, um, suffer from hypertension, high blood pressure, um, maybe have uh, body fat to muscle ratios that are not ideal. And, 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 and Langer uh, was, was perplexed by this because she said, hmm, it's odd, you know, because um, by definition, you know, hotel maids are, are laborers who are, you know, they're on their feet all day. They're moving around. They're doing aerobic and anaerobic activity. You know, why should those physical markers, which are a problem across our entire culture um, and in other nations, why, why should these workers be experiencing that? And so Langer and her colleagues uh, got together, a group of uh, working hotel mates. And um, again, they were divided into two groups. One was a control group, and the control group uh, just continued on with its with its work with no intervention whatsoever and the other group the active group um, was given now dig this was given um, accurate information about the aerobic and anaerobic benefits of their work you know pushing a vacuum cleaner walking up and down flights of stairs changing bed spreads um, you know stuff work you know and scrubbing and so the active group was given accurate information about the aerobic and the anaerobic benefits of their work, okay? And they went off and they were monitored. The control group was monitored. Everybody went back to doing their work without any physical changes whatsoever. No changes in routine, no changes in extracurricular activities, no changes in anything at home, same stuff. The group that was given accurate information about the physiological benefits of their work demonstrated weight loss, improved muscle to fat ratio, lowered blood pressure, um, greater uh, oxygeniz uh, oxygenization, you know, greater stamina, all kinds of factors that we look for to demarcate physical health based not on any change in routine, but only on having been given accurate information about the aerobic and anaerobic benefits of their work. That was all. And that was enough to trigger measurable bodily body changes from weight loss to improved muscle mass to lowered blood pressure. Not to mention general improvement in, in mood and, and lowering of anxiety levels. Just that. So transparently offered and accurate information was sufficient to reverse markers that we associate with ill health. So the question is, you know, how applicable is this? 
in what situations yield to it, what situations don't yield to it, how can we find ways to harness and define these qualities? So it's very exciting to me because we live in an era where, again, I think the question of numinosity, the question of interdimensionality, the question of the efficacy of the mind to actually shape and concretize events in the physical world, our ability to track, record, demarcate these things, this all exists. It all exists. So my hope, of course, my hope, of course, is that more funding becomes avail available for parapsychology research, that the polemical atmosphere that professional skepticism has brought to bear on study of the parapsychological gets toned down. We need to tamp down the rhetoric. You know, we as a human community have to be able to study these things and as alluded, it's not very expensive. These are not expensive experiments. They're infinitesimally small compared to budgets that are spent on other psychology experiments, all of which I want funded too. But I would like to see the funding um, situation loosen up a little bit. We as a culture can certainly afford it, and other cultures uh, can afford it. And, and I want to see the uh, polemical qualities get toned down around this stuff. You know, we've had enough of the polemical skepticism. You know, I think the parapsychological community, including a number of people on this call, has really dedicated itself to framing its work in a way that's, that's very responsible, that's not exaggerated, that's not far out. There's plenty of exaggeration in our culture and, you know, some of it exists within the New Age world and it gives me a headache. <laughs> and, and when I identify it, you know, I try to cool it down, I try to tamp it down. But that's not a problem uh, within the parapsychological community. And I think, by and large, the parapsychological community ha has really, really made a terrific effort to um, frame its data and its material in a very, very sober way. And, and benefits have come from that. I think great, great benefits have come from that. And it's a tough battle, you know. But I think, I think that the, the rhetoric, you know, coming from within the professional skeptic community, um, it needs to be tamped down, you know, at this point. It needs to be tamped down. And um, I, want to, um, I want to wrap up by telling you uh, two stories about unusual events to which I was uh, privy. Uh, the first story involves uh, a man who um, belonged to a very deep, intellectually driven, um, esoteric, philosophical, spiritual uh, organization that was dedicated from a spiritual perspective to studying some of the stuff that we've been uh, talking about. And um, this particular organization, which sometimes uh, taxed people's physical abilities and, and, and limits, uh, was organizing a winter camping trip. And for any of you who have ever been winter camping, you know it's grueling. I remember years ago I was going on a winter camping trip and I asked one of my best friends to come with me. He adamantly refused. And I said, you know, why won't you come? And he said, because the best you can possibly hope for is to have a terrible time. And he was correct. But for some reason, we as a human species feel the need to winter camp. So <laughs> off I went. But anyway, getting back to my story. Um, so the organization of which this man was a part organized a uh, winter camping trip. And... Uh, a teacher uh, within this organization, a senior person, uh, came to this man and he said, listen, um, and there was a little bit of humor in this, but, but it, was, it was told to him seriously. He was given a task. He was told, um, uh, we're going to go out and we're going to get some buckets uh, so that the female members of the, um, the group 
if they need to uh, relieve themselves at night, don't have to go off into the freezing cold woods. And uh, uh, your job, uh, he told uh, this man, is to go out and uh, get um, pink heart-shaped buckets. Kind of a strange request, right? Pink heart-shaped buckets. And these pink heart-shaped buckets were going to serve as uh, chamber pots, in effect, uh, to go into the uh, tents of the female uh, campers so they didn't have to go traversing into the woods if they needed to relieve themselves in the winter night. Okay. So uh, so he said to the man, listen, uh, so you got to go buy these pink heart-shaped buckets. you got to find them. Now, if you come up blank, this guy lived in New York City, if you come up uh, blank, then you can resort to buying uh, red buckets, okay? And so uh, the man went off and um, he looked all around New York City for these pink heart-shaped buckets, came up blank. I mean, went everywhere. Went to hardware stores, bed bath stores, contractor stores, you name it. Nothing. Big city, lots of stores, commercial hub, nothing. He couldn't find pink heart-shaped buckets. So then he decided, well, all right, I'm going to go to plan B, and I'm going to go look for these um, uh, red buckets. Maybe they won't be heart-shaped. Maybe they'll just be regular round red buckets. Now, that sounded to me like a pretty easy task. But, again, made phone calls. This was a little bit in the pre-internet days, but uh, still made phone calls, went to hardware stores, home decor stores, whatever. Couldn't even find any red buckets. And he thought to himself, this is nuts. And he tried, and he really, really tried. Didn't want to disappoint his teacher, didn't want to disappoint himself. He had been given a task to do. And uh, he made his best efforts. And he thought to himself, well, look, you know, I'm gonna have to call my teacher and tell him, listen, I tried, but I failed. And so the guy was standing outside of a, uh, like a local neighborhood grocery store, and he was going to take out his cell phone and call his teacher, but something told him, you know, don't do it just yet, just wait, for whatever reason. So he had to just go run some very ordinary errand at this local kind of nothing grocery store that was uh, nearby his uh, apartment. So he goes inside the grocery store, walks to the back to the frozen food section to get milk or eggs or something. And what does he see? A pile of brand new pink heart-shaped buckets. Just at the point that he had been prepared to give up. Just at the point that he had been prepared to give up after making every single effort possible and holding off just that one last instance, there appears this extraordinary event where in the middle of this nothing little neighborhood grocery store, there's the coveted item for which he had been searching. And uh, the man grabs the stock boy and says, you know, What's with these buckets? And the stock boy says, they, I don't know, they just came in today. True story. True story. Now, um, skeptics will say, well, you know, there's a law of large numbers, which says, sure, it might be unusual for that to happen uh, in the life of an individual, but we live in a big world, so by definition, unusual things are going to happen. They have to happen to somebody somewhere. And... My response to that is, yeah, but actuarial tables are really very good at measuring things across large populations. But what they can't measure is the, the stakes in the game that a person has emotionally. The meaning of the event in the life of the individual is a wholly infinite and heightening aspect of occurrences. It wasn't just that the unlikely occurred, although that was part of it. It was the emotional stakes and the profundity of meaning and intimacy that the event had in the life of, in, of, of, of uh, in the life of the individual 
that no actuarial table can quite get at, that the law of numbers, large numbers, can't quite get at. I want to leave that aside for a second tell you another story that happened to another man. This man was this man was uh, getting married um, in uh, California and um, his bride, uh, his fiance, uh, was from uh, Germany and uh, she, uh, they met, uh, they were getting wed uh, here in the, in the United States on the West Coast. Um, she had been uh, raised by her mom and um, by her grandfather. Her father uh, died at a young age. And um, her grandfather, uh, Walter, uh, died when she was still a, a young woman, um, maybe about age 16 or so. And um, he was a very meaningful figure in her life. Uh, he was a figure of profound and deeply intimate uh, importance in the life of this woman. And uh, she uh, owned some of his personal effects, heirlooms, which were very meaningful to her. And so some of his effects, uh, his possessions, were shipped uh, to the United States so that they could be uh, part of her new uh, home she was making with the man that she was marrying. And um, the man she was marrying uh, told the story that uh, among her, her grandfather's personal effects was this, this old transistor radio you know, going back to the 70s and um, hadn't been used in a very long time and he was hoping to uh, do something uh, nice and meaningful for his, uh, his, his, his wife-to-be and he looked into seeing whether he could get the thing working again. So he put in fresh batteries, wasn't working. He, looked at the circuitry to see if he could solder it, if there was some way to fix it, and nothing worked, nothing worked. So, you know, unfortunately, he took the thing and just put it away in a desk drawer somewhere, as we do from time to time with, with old stuff that we can't get to work, but that maybe we have an emotional attachment to. So, um, they had the wedding ceremony, it was at home, uh, and uh, his, uh, his new wife said to him, listen, there's you know, there's something I want to tell you. I want to, you know, talk to you in private. And they, they went back into the bedroom and she said, you know, uh, I'm so happy, but I, I miss my grandfather terribly. I, I feel such an emptiness that he can't be here with us today. And, and they heard music and they couldn't figure out where in the world are we hearing music from. And th they had no such device in the bedroom. They checked every possible place. They even opened up a back door to see if maybe one of the neighbors was playing music. They could not crack it. And then they realized that the music was coming out of the previously broken transistor radio. And the man's daughter said to him that when the couple was in the bedroom earlier getting ready for the, the marriage ceremony, she too had heard music coming out of their room. They hadn't heard it, but she had heard music. And this radio that had been mysteriously unworkable that belonged to her grandfather was playing a, a beautiful, sweet love song at the moment that they were having their exchange. And they went back to sleep that night uh, and they fell asleep to that radio playing classical music. And it never worked again, it never worked again. And the man to whom this happened was somebody who considered himself a very, you know, hard-headed rationalist guy. And he said, hey, I know all about the law of large numbers. I get it. But what the law of large numbers doesn't really measure is the emotional impact of an event, the emotional stakes, meaning, and intimate value of an event in the life of the individual. And just as my new wife was talking about missing her grandfather, that we would hear a love song coming over this previously unworking and thereafter unworking transistor radio shook my sense of materialism to its core. Now I want you to dig this. Do you know who these men were? The guy in the first story with the pink buckets was me. That happened to me. The guy in the second story with the mysterious transistor radio, that was the professional skeptic 
Michael Shermer, writing a column in Scientific American. My story appeared in January 2014 in my book, One Simple Idea, which is a history of the positive mind mo movement. Michael's story appeared in October 2014 in Scientific American. I had never known his story until quite recently. It came to my attention as I was doing some research several months ago for a class that I was teaching. He and I, the seeker and the skeptic, were making the exact same point, the exact same point. And I invite you, I invite you, the listener, take a look at the story in my book, One Simple Idea, published in January of 2014. Take a look at Michael's column in Scientific American, published in October 2014. See if I haven't rendered these things accurately. Test me. We were making the exact same point. And it led me to wonder, is there really such a chasm between the responsible seeker and the responsible skeptic? Or is it all just the convention of polemics? And if it's just the convention of polemics, let's get rid of the polemics. Let's search together. Let's stop trying to treat everything like a chessboard or to flip over the chessboard if the game isn't going well for us or what have you. We don't need it. We don't need it. What we need to do is follow the example of a, of a JB and Louisa Ryan and, and let's search. Let's really ask the question, you know, what is out there? What is around the next corner? What can I see if I climb up to that ridge or if I climb up to that peak? Let's ask what life is in a complete way and in a real way, not worrying about who's going to win the debate, but forgetting about the nature of the, the debate. It's so secondary. If someone like me, who's dedicated his life to the metaphysical search, and someone like Michael Shermer, who's dedicated his life to his version of, of skepticism, are making the same point then it has to suggest that we live in a generation where there is possibility for real discovery. And I ask us to, to seize this moment together, to take this moment together, and let the best of our capacities lead the way.